وصلي وسلم وبارك وكلم على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم القيامة نوين التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله تعالى وسنة رسول وابتغاء مرضات سبحانه وتعالى اللهم إنا نسألك فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين وإلهام الملائكة المقربين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We thank and we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us We thank and we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to gather in a gathering in which remembers Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who allowed us to gather in a gathering in which we learn more about Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we send salutations upon the beloved of Allah, beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his blessings and his mercy upon his family and his companions and all those that follow him until the day of Qiyamah and all those that are present. So we continue in a class in which we learn aqidah, in which we learn uh, tawheed, in which we learn how to understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the attributes of the Prophets salam, and we learn about the Prophets and we learn about the books and we learn about the day of Qiyamah and we find ourselves busy with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the past few classes we spoke about wujud, we spoke about the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is the meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being present how to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present and how to understand through the Qur'an and Sunnah and how to un- logically understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. And we said that we started with that because you cannot learn or try to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-seeing or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all-hearing or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pre-eternal or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is post-eternal except until you learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. And so we went through that and we understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present and we understood how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present and we understood why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. So today we move on to another attribute from wujud to qidam. It says there are 20, character, character, 20 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's mentioned in Aqidah al-Awami, he said, Allah mawjood, qadim, baqi, mukhalif, lil khalq bil itlaqi, wa qaim, ghani, wahid, wa hay, qadir, murid, alim, bi kulli shay, sami'u, nil basir, wa mutakallim, wa law sifat, sabat, tantalim, kudra, irada, sam'u, basar, hayat, nil ilm, kalam, nistama. That there are 20 attributes that are compulsory upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 20 attributes that are inevitable. We have something that in wajib, mustahil, and jais. If we speak about fiqh, wajib is something that's compulsory. Mustahil is something that we cannot imagine, and jais is something that's allowed. But if we speak in aqidah, something that is jais is something that is, um, what is the word that we said, that we mentioned in the past classes? Something that is jais is something that is conceivable. And something that is mustahil is something that's inconceivable. And something that is wajib is something that's inevitable. Meaning when we say something is wajib, an attribute is wajib for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an attribute is inevitable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to have these attributes. Right? Without these attributes, then it cannot be then it cannot be considered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these attributes are attributes which only somebody that's complete has. And if we look at the definition that is given for God, or the definition that is given for the word Allah, he said, Ismun. He said, Alamun ala that. That is the name upon the essence, Al Wajib al Wujud, whose existence is inevitable, Al Munazza an Kuldin Naqais, and any defect is taken away from him, Wal Muttasif bi Kulil Kamalat, and he is encompassed and filled with every completion, with every view of completion, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say al-qidam, al-qidam means pre-eternity or pre-existence, right? And if before we go into speaking about the 
monotheism part, the Tawhidi part, if you look at the word Qidam in the Arabic language, right? Qidam means old, Qadim, something is old. So the word Qidam, we have three types, right? We have Qidam Dhati, Qidam Zamani, and Qidam Idhafi. Qidam Dhati is speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say Qidam Dhati, we speak about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being pre-eternal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being pre-existent. But when you say Qidam Zamani, Qidam Zamani is referring to us. Qidam Zamani refers to, Zaman means time. So when you say Qidam Zamani, it refers to a long amount of time, right? For example, so you say Qidam Dhati, this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning. If you say Qidam Zamani, right? First of all, Qidam Dhati refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qidam Zamani refers to us as creation. Qidam Zamani is referred to a certain amount of time, right? It's tool in Buddha, a certain amount of long time, right? Or a long amount of time. That is Qidam Zamani. If you give an example of one year, right? They give an example in the books where they say that the scholars will give an example that if a master says to his slaves, right? They used to, master used to have slaves. So when he says to his slaves that Man kana min abidi, man kana min abidi qadiman fawahur. That those of you who were my slaves for a year, right, you are free now. But he uses the word qadim. So for this example, he's using qidam zamani. Right, he's explaining. So he said qidam that refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qidam zamani refers to qidam. So when you speak about age, when you speak about numbers, when you speak about the future and the present, it's referring to qidam zamani. Right? When we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we're speaking about here is qidam dhati, about the essence that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being pre-eternal. And then we have qidam idhafi. Qidam idhafi is an added age, for example, the difference between a father and his son, the difference of age. Right? And this attribute is also known as al-muhimmat al-umahat. Right? So we have attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the attributes are important, but then we have attributes on top of that that are more important. And these are one of those attributes. Right? These attributes are known as one of the most important attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it rejects the opposite of it. Right? Something that is inconceivable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be an incident. Right? And the opposite of being pre-eternal is being an incident. So... If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there before time, right, then it means he is not encompassed in time, so he cannot be an incident. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not creation, right? So when you say al-qidam, pre-eternity in monotheism refers to beginninglessness, all right? Words that we've used before in the past classes. Pre-eternity, when you speak about monotheism, when you speak about tawheed, it refers to beginninglessness, right? Meaning that there is no beginning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. He thus has not been subject to any creation. Right? Because something that has a beginning is something that has a beginning is subject to to change. Right? If you have a beginning, for example, you were born, you had a beginning. Then you grow, then you grow up to be a child, you grow up to be an adult, you grow old, you pass away your body, lots all phases, different phases you go to. Right? So creation is subject to change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has no beginning, so he cannot be subject to change. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not subject to change, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an incident. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an incident, therefore he cannot be considered creation. So if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one without beginning, right? We say that beginninglessness is a necessary attribute for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Right? Why would we say that it's a necessary attribute? Like we said before, that is one of the most important attributes, right? Because it refutes the opposite of it, which is muhtith, which means that is an incident, 
right? Because some of it has a beginning and incident. So we say logically, right? Like we said in Aqidah, we have Dalil Aqli and Dalil Naqli. We have logical evidence and we have evidence from the Quran and Sunnah, right? If we bring evidence from the Quran and Sunnah, it's clear. But why do we learn logical evidence? Because if a non-Muslim wants to come ask you, right? They don't believe in the Quran and Sunnah. Somebody that doesn't understand the Quran and Sunnah, right? You have to logically understand, logically explain it to them. This is why we learn logical evidence, right? In the Quran and Sun- in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wal awal wal akhir." The scholars of tafs- the scholars of tafsir say that "Wal awal bila bidaya, wal akhir bila nihaya." That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the first, and He had no beginning, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will be the last, and He has without an end, right? And this goes hand in hand, right? Here we speak about pre-eternity, qidam. After qidam, the next attribute to learn is al-baqa, post-eternity. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so pre-eternity, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there before existence. Post-eternity, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there after existence. So logically, why is beginninglessness a necessary attribute for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? So we say logically, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning, right? Then he must have been created. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning, then he must have been created because something that has a beginning is subject to change. And if something is subject to change, it's considered an incident. And if something is considered an incident, right? It's considered creation. So, theoretically speaking, right? In Tawheed, we most of the time we speak theoretically so we can understand. So we say theoretically speaking. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning, then he must have been created. If he had been created, then nothing in creation would have existed. Right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was creation, then nothing in creation would have existed. Why? Because if he was subject to creation, then he must have needed a creator. Right? If he was subject to creation, he must have needed a creator. And that creator that created him must also need a creator. And the creator that created him must also need a creator. Right? And you go like this in an infinite loop that that person need a creator and that need a creator and there will be no existence. Right? Go in an, inf- in an infinite an infinite loop. loop. Right? An infinite loop. Because the concept of infinity right, is something that we try to understand. We say infinity, we see the side with eight says infinity. Right? The concept of infinity is something that is very difficult to understand. Right? If you want to un- try to understand infinity, there is something that you can read up. It's called the infinity bus theory. Right? The infinity bus theory. You can read it up. If you don't want, you can search on YouTube. There's a video about it. The infinity bus theory. It's a nice cartoon that you can watch that explains it. Infinity bus theory, if you want to try to understand infinity, but at the end of the video, it shows you that you cannot really understand infinity, right? Because if something goes in an infinite loop for an infinite amount of time, in the end, there would be nothing. So logically, right? This is inconceivable for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's inconceivable, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning, right? The matter of creation of this world must have started with one whose existence has no beginning. Right? Because if you're saying that something has a beginning, then you're adding a defect. Right? Because something is not something complete. You say something is beginninglessness, right? There's no defect. Something, if something has a beginning, it has an end. Right? You put it like that. Something has a beginning, then it definitely has an end. But if something has no beginning, then clearly it won't have an end. Right? That's why some, some scholars they would mention, they would say that, that the attribute of baqa, right, helps to explain the attribute of qidam. Right? Once you understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everlasting, you'll understand that he has no beginning. Because something that has a beginning will have an end. Right? So, it's very easy to understand. Qidam, right? And there might be enough time after this to go into Baqa, right? To go into post eternity, right? There's just there's one issue that you mentioned in this, and then there's three or four examples that you mention on it, right? 
Because lots of people misunderstand the concept of time and the concept of pre-eternity. Right? Most people. Right? It says time, first thing, time is an abstract concept. Right? Time is an abstract concept. It started with the creation of the universe and many events happen in it. Right? From the creation of the universe, and many events happen in time. Right? Time is divided into parts. Certain parts. You have the past, the present, the future. Right? Time is divided into three parts. Past, present, future. And time is given to creation. Right? So, this is for creation. The concepts such as century, year, month, day, yesterday, tomorrow. Right? Like that. Or for creation, right? You never use these concepts for the creator. Anything creation, you would say tomorrow, yesterday, today. Now, if you look at pre-eternity. Pre-eternity. Okay, first of all, if you say pre-eternity, right? Most people, they will say pre-eternity is the beginning of time. The beginning of time. Right? But pre-eternity does not mean before the beginning of time. It doesn't mean the beginning of time. And it does not mean before the beginning of time. Right? In the realities of pre-eternity, there is no past, there is no present, and there is no future. Right? Pre-eternity is a station where all times are seen and known at the same time. That is pre-eternity. A station where all time is known and seen at the same time. So to understand pre-eternity, right, we'll use a couple examples. Like we said, three or four examples. Right, three or four examples, and we'll make it easier for you to understand. Right, three or four examples. The first one be a simple example. Right, um, the first one be a simple example. So firstly, what are we doing? Just try to imagine a straight line. Try to think of a straight line. Right? So you think of a straight line. Alright? The middle of the line is the present. The middle of the line is the present. Right? And the left side of the line is the past. And between the past and the present, right, we have the creation of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the first man, Satan, Adam, and everything that happened from the past to the present. Right? Everything that happened in your life till now, till this moment, right? The past and the present. And then we have the present, this is the future. The future. From the present to the future, we have your children being born, your grandchildren and their grandchildren, the day of judgment, everything that happens, the day of judgment, beyond the day of judgment. Right? That's all from the present to the future. Right, the future continues. So, if we were to ask you what is eternality, what is eternal? Right, do we say that eternality is the left side or the right side? Right? If we were to say that eternality is the left side, Right? <clears throat> if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being eternal, right, is from the left side, the past, we will say that if we say this, if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows what will happen tomorrow, right? You're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
he already knows the future. Right? He already knows what comes tomorrow. He already knows what will happen tomorrow. Right? And this comes in when we have a misconception. Right? When we say, it speaks a bit, this example speak a bit about explaining the concept of destiny. Right? What is your destiny? So, if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows tomorrow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you just know what will happen tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Some people would say that if God wrote that I was going to be a sinner in my destiny, then what is my fault? Right? But when we understand the concept of pre-eternity, right, we find that this whole concept is insignificant. Right? Because pre-eternity is not the left side of the cross. Right? Pre-eternity is not the left side. Pre-eternity, in one word, is timelessness. Right? We've learned beginninglessness, we've learned nothingness, we have timelessness. Right? In reality, pre-eternity, it holds and it encompasses the past, the present and the future. Right? So, if we say that pre-eternity holds the past, the present and the future, right? The concept of pre-eternity. And we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is pre-eternal. I mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the past, the present and the future. But not how you see the cross, but not how we understand it. Right? We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the past, then he sees the present, then he sees the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the past, the present and the future at the same time. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what you did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what you are doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what you will do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what you will not do and if you did it, what you would have done. Right? And you will use another example. Right? This one. This one is easy to understand. Right? The second one should be easy, inshallah. I don't think we need to go for this one. So for example, if we have somebody driving from coming to the masjid, right? So we have somebody, three people coming to the masjid, right? The one walks from I don't know, it's not there. The one, okay, we say people coming to the masjid, three people driving to this masjid, right? The one's driving in Stranfontein. They by the side, driving in Stranfontein. The other one is driving on Stavotain Road and the one is driving in Weinberg, right? They all came from Weinberg Masjid and they're coming to this Masjid. But it's three different cars. One is Stavotain, one here, by Stavotain, by the sign, one is Stavotain Road and one in Weinberg. Right? So, the one that's passed the sign in Stavotain to the one before him that was in Stavotain Road Right? He is in the future um, position of the person before him. Right? Meaning that the person before him will drive past that destination soon. And to the person that's turning in by the self sign now, the person that just left the wine book must use in the past. Right? But each one of them driving by themselves. Right? The one that's down somewhere the road to him himself is in the prison. Right? The one driving down somewhere the road, him himself is in the prison. The one that just left the Majin wine book, him himself is in the prison. But to the other person, the destination is either his future destination, and to the one that got there, the other guy that's still by wine book, Mashi, that's his past destination. Right? Now we have, we, we use the same words, like we said that past, present, future are used for creation. So we say the one, the one is in the future, the one is in the present, the one is in the past, right? In reality, they are all in the present. But if we look at the sun, 
right? If we look at the sun, the sun shines down on all three cores at the same time. Am I right or am I wrong? The sun shines down, all, shines upon all three cores at the same time, right? So you can't say that the, the sun is shining upon the first core in the future, the second one in the present, the third one in the past, right? The sun, one place, shines upon all three cores at the same time, right? So we cannot say that, that the sun, right, in the past according to the situation, or the sun is in the future according to that situation. Because the sun enlightens three vehicles and encompasses all of them with its light at the same time, right? This condition of the sun, namely not being limited with time and encompass three time periods, right? The sun, we're speaking now about the concept of pre-eternity, right? So the sun not being limited, right? The sun is limited but in this scenario, right? You would say that the sun not being limited with time, right? And periods at the same moment. Unlike the vehicles is an example of pre-eternity. Meaning that the sun shines on all three cores at the same time without saying the sun is in the future or in the present or in the past. Because like we said, to the person that just left Weinberg's masjid now, the person that's in, that when past is for then sign, Right? He's in his future destination. Right? And the person that passed down for the road, the guy that left a wine book masjid now, that person's in his past destination. Right? So have past, present, future. But the sun at all of these times shines upon all these people at the same time. So this is a con this is an understanding of the concept of pre-eternity. Right? This is likewise. We are in a period of time. Likewise, we are in a period of time, right? We are on a road, we're driving, right? We're on a period of time. Our period of time started from the creation of the universe. Everything that passed before us is in the past when compared to the present, right? So, I was born, I grew up, I got married, I had a child, this, 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 everything that happened as your life went on, right, when you remember it, it's part of the past, right? So the same, he says that before us is in the past when it's compared to the present, right? Everything that you remember compared to now is considered the past. Because it became a thing of the past, right? The times after today and this moments and the creation that will be created in those times or in the future when it's compared to the present times. So if I was to think about my children, my grandchildren, their grandchildren, thinking about Kriyama, thinking about what will happen, crossing the Sirat, being questioned, all of these things, right? Buying a new house, buying a new car in the future. Right? So we understand from these concepts, right? Such as the past, the future, and the present are used for us. However, there are no such concepts for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? All these concepts that we use, the past, the present, the future, was all for creation. It was all for us. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses all these times at the same moment. Example, the sun that enlightened all three cause at the same moment. Right? So, we cannot say that God wrote something. Right? So we are doing it. Say, God wrote this, so we are doing it. Right? You, you do something, but obviously, ah, Allah wrote it for me, so I did it. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses all times at the same moment with His pre-eternity. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows our deeds that we make with our free will and so whatever we do during our lifetime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote them on our destiny board the cause of our deeds is not the writing of God right and that is that goes into speaking about something else but let's mention the, the fourth example right and we're trying to 
explain a bit faster because we want to see if anybody has questions about what we went through before and if there's time after questions then we'll go to Baka. Right? Because Kidam is simple to understand. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pre-eternal. He has no beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning. So he's not an incident because he's not an incident. He's not creation. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wal awwalu wa awwal akhirat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first. Right? Scholars of tafsir say, scholars of tafsir say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the meaning of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first with no beginning. So the third example, the last example that we would use, right, is that if you know a poem, right, if you have a poem that you like and you memorize the whole poem, right, in the relation of your knowledge with all lines of the poem is the same, right? The way you look at it, you memorize the poem, right? As you look at it, all these lines of poetry are the same. So as you mentioned before, the sun encompasses the three vehicles at the same moment, right? Likewise, your knowledge about the poem encompasses all lines at the same moment, right? So you memorize poetry, and you memorize the whole poem, right? So you know the whole poem at the same time. But if you were to look at not your knowledge of the poem, if you take a page, write it down, look at the lines of the poem, right? If you look, for example, at the sixth line, right? The sixth line is after the fourth line. And before the tenth line, right? When you finish writing the fifth line and start to write the sixth line, the fifth line becomes a thing of the past. The sixth line is at the present time. Right? So before the fifth line is at the present time, then you wrote the sixth line. So the fifth line become, became a thing, of the past, a thing of the past, and the sixth line became a thing of the present. The tenth line is in the future, right? because you never wrote it down yet. The tenth line is in the future. So it does not come into being yet. Right? Like we said, you never wrote it yet. However, the tenth line that has not come into being yet is available in your knowledge. Remember, you memorize the poem and you're writing it down, right? So all those, you say you wrote one to six. All those lines that you wrote before are considered in the past, right? The sixth one that you just wrote now, that you are writing now, is the present. And the tenth line that you never wrote yet, right, is considered in the future. So then the sequence in the poem is not the point. Right, the sequence in the poem is not a point at issue for your knowledge, right? For your understanding, because when you remember the poem, you remember the whole poem in your head, right? But the way that you're writing it, same concept, past, present, future. Like we said, everything in creation, right, falls under the past, the present, to the future. Likewise, the 19th century and the people living in this century, right? The 19th century and the people living in the century is in the future when it is compared to the people living in the 18th century. And they are in the past when it is compared to the 20th century. Right? So we have the 19th century, the 18th century, and the 20th century. Again, but we have the 18th century, right? Is the past. For the people in the 19th century, the 18th century is considered the past. But if we go again to the people in the 18th century, for that, that was considered the present, right? But now the 19th century is the present. Then if we look at the people in the 20th century, to the people in the 90th, in the 19th century, they will be the future. But if we come to people in the 20th century, for them, the people in the 19th century are the past and they are the present. So he says that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is dependent from time and sees all these centuries at the same time, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the past, the present, and the future at the same time. The future at the same time in the moment of his knowledge, right? They brought it back to the poetry, right? If you memorized poetry, right? You have the whole poem in your head, but you are writing it line by line, 
but you and you have everything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He recognizes the past, the present, and the future, right, as one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognize the past, the present, and the future as one. Right? So if we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pre-eternal, and somebody says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pre-eternal, then where was he? Right? Because pre-eternity means before time. Right? You say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is before time and space. It's inconceivable to try to completely understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks like, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, right? Inconceivable, meaning that no matter how much you try, you won't. And we mentioned this in almost every class. We say that in Aqeedah, they say, Kullu ma khatr fi balik, fallah khilaf dalik. That anything that you can imagine or conceive in your head, anything that you can think about, Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far from that, completely different to that. Right? And once you understand this, that you will never, especially about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Aqeedah entails attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, attributes about the prophets, knowing the prophets, knowing the books, knowing about the day of Qiyamah. Right? But this concept, the first concept of Aqeedah, right, you will never completely understand. Right? So now Bakari says, وَعَدَمُ دَرَكُ الْإِدْرَاكُ إِدْرَاكُ Right? وَالْبَحْثُ عَنُ كُفْرٌ وَإِشْرَاكُ That once you understand that you cannot fully understand, then you will completely understand. Right? In Aqeedah. So if you told something in Aqeedah, and you're given logical proof, and you're given proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, right? And you still don't believe it, and you go try to search at this fake, he said, وَالْبَحْثُ عَنُ كُفْرٌ وَإِشْرَاكُ Right? That researching these things that will lead to kufr, why shock? That's why they would advise those that study aqidah, those that study tawhid, not to go into too much depth in aqidah unless you have strong iman. Right? Because there are very, there are lots of logical things. Right? And sometimes they come and they say, the scientist said this, and the scientist said this, or a philosopher said this, so what do you say? Right, so you have to know how to answer. So now, before we go further, we go to the next attribute. Because like we said, this was easy to understand. And hopefully everybody understands. Right? Like we, we, were, we were to simplify it. Right? In a few sentences, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qadim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pre-eternal. Pre-eternal means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning. Right? Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a beginning, that would mean that he was subject to change. Because everything that has a beginning is subject to change. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was subject to change, he would be an incident. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was an incident, you would need a trigger. Right? Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have needed a creator. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needed a creator, the one that created him would have needed a creator. And the one who created him would have needed a creator. And we would go in an infinite loop for eternity. Which means that as we go in this loop, no creation would be created and there would be no creation. Logically. Simple. Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَالْآخِرُ Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He is the first and the last. This is, this is um, proof from the Qur'an for qidam and baqa. Baqa is the one that is the attribute that we'll do in the next class. It says qidam wal baqa. Qidam, pre-eternity. Right? So, huwa al Scholars of tafsir say, the first before everything. Before everything. Right? Before creation, before time, before everything. Wal akhir, baqa. Right? Post-eternity, right? Or everlasting, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wal-akhiru, right? Scholars of tafsir say that wal-akhiru, the last, without an ending, without an ending, wal-akhiru bila nihaya, right? Meaning that everybody will pass and die except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Till they say that even the angels will die when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells Malik al to take the ruh of Sayyidina Jibreel, right? will be the last person to die. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asks Sayyidina Jibreel, who's left? 
and Sayyidina Al Jibril says, just me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take your own soul. So Sayyidina Al Jibril dies, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one left. Right? This is what Akhiru, Bila Nihaya. Everybody dies except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullu man alayha fan wa yabqa wajhu rabbika dhul jalali wa likram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that everything in this world will perish and the only remaining thing will be the face of your Lord. Dhul jalali wa likram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says kullu shayin halikun illa wajha. That everything will perish except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Anybody have questions about what we said before? About Aqeedah, about Tawheed? Aqeedah is belief. Right? Aqeedah is belief. So it's not just something like the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the attributes of Allah. That is Tawheed. Aqeedah is your belief. Right? Like we said in the last class, we explained the misunderstanding that people have of the word Pida. And we said that the better word is not innovation. The better word to use is unorthodox. Alright? So does anybody have a question about Aqeedah? Anything in Aqeedah? Hmm? Sheikh, I just got the statement. So, regarding to tonight's lesson, if you go to Surah Ikhlas, mm-hmm. then that one attribute of Allah, it sums up this actually. as Eternal. Hmm? Allah, Allah is eternal, so that sums up the scholars will say that Surah Ikhlas is a synopsis or a summary of Tawheed. Yeah. Right? A summary of Tawheed, meaning the Tawheed that pertains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes. Right? This is that. Qul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Qul. Huwa Allah ahad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. So first of all, you understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. You understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. Right? Kul wallahu ahad. Allah samad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. Meaning pre-eternal, post-eternal. Right? Lam yalid wa lam yulad. You understand that after baqa you learn something called mukhalifun il hawadi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different from creation. Right? Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not give birth. Right? And He was not born. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Laysa ka mithlihi shay. Right? That there is nothing like him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad. Right? And there will be nothing like him. There is nothing like him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Not even the peace of him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing like it. Right? So they say that Surah Ikhlas is a synopsis of Tawheed. Right? It's a summary of Tawheed. Everything that we explain, if you go to Surah Ikhlas, you'll understand it. Right? Or you'll see it in the Surah. Uh, just with regards to um, what uh, Mother May explained to Sheikh, uh, she explained to her about Al Qaeda. As Muslims, I think we already believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Muslims, I don't think we, we need proof of what is pre existence. For example, Al Qaeda. Well, if Sheikh says al qaeda means like, for example, there's no, Allah is no beginning or ending, then we as Muslims, we submit to that and we believe that. Mm-hmm. And especially with al qaeda where Sheikh says, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to understand pre, pre, pre-existence. Uh, so, so I don't think personally it's necessary to explain in depth, especially if it's difficult to understand. Because the more examples are on that, if then it's almost like it becomes more difficult to understand. Know what I mean. So it's, I, I think it's sufficiently what we just said that um, Al Qaeda means uh, Allah has no beginning and Allah has no ending. And I think that is sufficient for us as Muslims to, to understand. So, the first one would be why do we learn Aqida, right? If, and a lot of people ask why do we learn Aqida if we, we Muslims we just submit, right? The word Islam comes from East Islam, submission. Right? But we, what we need to understand is the word Islam comes from East Islam. The word Islam comes from submission, but Islam is not submission. Right? Islam, meaning that Islam is not based upon submission. Islam is based upon love. Right? Once, example, once you love something, you submit to it. 
right? Because if you have submission, you can have submission in which you are forced to do it, or you do it out of love, right? So Islam is based on love. So if we say we just hear things and we submit, we hear things and we submit. An example, you hear you must make salah, but you don't learn how to make salah. So you make salah, but you don't know how. You shall not accept it. You just submit. It's not accepted, right? You're told to make salah, you don't know how to read Fatiha, right? So if you say you are born, you just believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's fine. The, the scholars would say that one of the scholars of Tawheed is he used to go into depth and then the lady said that um, Surah Ikhlas is enough and he said that I wish I had the Tawheed of that lady, the Iman of that lady. Right? But so why do we learn? Right? If it was just sufficient for us to just submit and just do, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have made learning compulsory, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, That seeking knowledge is compulsory. You have fard ayn and you have fard kifaya. Right? Fard kifaya is something that if some people do it, right, that falls away. Right? For example, if I sneeze and I say alhamdulillah, right, it's fard kifaya for at least one person say alhamdulillah. If nobody says alhamdulillah, everybody get, gets punished, right? Fard kifaya. Fard ayn. So you have fard ayn. It's compulsory. Right? Fard ayn meaning compulsory. That every person has to do it. Right? Every person has to learn the basics of the deen. Which is Islam, Iman, Ihsan. Aqidah falls under Iman. Right? So, now you say, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, yes, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there? If you're going to bring an eye of the Quran, somebody says, okay, maybe somebody Muslim that knows the Quran. Right? But in today's time, how much people really know the Quran? This is why the scholars went and they say we have to learn logical evidence. Because if you have a non Muslim, even not a non Muslim, you have. We have the Mu'tazila, right? The Mu'tazila or a sect, right? They say that the that logic comes before this is aql, yuqaddim ala naql, right? That your logic comes, it's in front of you, um, evidence of the Quran and Sunnah, right? If you can't logically prove something, right? Then they don't believe it. And there's something that, hap- that every person, happens to every person. If somebody comes to you and explains something, you can say that you're submissive and you can believe firm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. Right? You can believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present. Or if I was to say, you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Why? Because Allah says, Kulu Allah wa hai. Right? So I tell you, why can't Allah be three? Why can't Allah be five? Why can't Allah be four? And you don't know the answer. And I go home and you think about this. All right? Two things will happen. Either you think about this and you start getting shak. And shak in Iman is very dangerous. Shak in your Aqidah is very dangerous. All right? In some fiqh books they will start off where they will say things that you say or things that you think about that immediately puts you into kufr. If you think about it wrong. Another thing that will happen is you go to Sheikh Mufti Google and you start watching the wrong stuff and searching the wrong stuff. Right? So, if I was to say that why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not three? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala two? Right? Why? So we explain it, right? So you understand so that you don't go home and you don't think about it. If we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, theoretically, we say there was God one, God two, God three. Theoretically, right? We say it's just God one and God two, theoretically speaking, right? Three things will happen. Firstly, firstly, they will both, they will both disagree. 
All right? They will both disagree. So, if I say they both disagree, meaning that they both disagree to create something, none of them agree. Meaning that if they both disagree on creation, there will be no creation. All right? Refuted. The second thing that will happen is the one agrees and the one disagrees. Meaning that God 1 creates the universe. God 2 removes the universe out of existence. God 1 creates it again. God 2 removes it out of existence. And we go in this infinite loop again of creation, non-creation, creation, non-creation. Right? Refuted. Before we go to the third one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِيَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَ That if there were any lords or gods except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَفَسَدَتَ That there would be havoc, right, in the worlds. And for the third one, if they both agreed on something, right, if they both agreed on something, Why do we understand? Why do we learn? Right? We learn so that we can understand. We learn to teach. Right? Islam is based on love and Islam is based on da'wah. What is da'wah? Calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And da'wah doesn't mean calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just standing on the minbar giving jumu'ah, just standing and talking. Da'wah is first of all through your state. They say, Dawatul Hal Afsah min Dawatul Waqa. That calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your state is better than calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through what you say. Right? But, okay, before we go on to that, that we learn so that we can benefit people, so that people can benefit from us, so that we can be the reason that people enter into Islam. Right? And examples are given so that we understand things better. Right? So that we understand things more clearly. Right? Because the way we are explaining it now, the way that we explain this in the class, is simplified ten times the way it was taught to us. Right? We came and this book, right? We have books at home, but we take this book and we open all our books and we write down, simplifying this as easy as we can, right? So we simplify it and we give the examples that you can understand so that you can remove any shak because the way we are created, the way humans are created is that we have doubt, right? You can say that you, sub, you, you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we all have doubt. If somebody asks one question or they refute something, then we have doubt, right? There are certain things that if we say it now, then everybody will doubt everything. But if you give you the answer, then you'll understand. And the answer only comes through learning. The answer only comes through examples. The answer only comes through understanding. So that is why we give the examples. A 
it's almost Isha, so we're not going to go to the next attribute. So, any questions? That thing? The Ruh. The Ruh, what about the Ruh? The Ruh has a beginning, but the Ruh don't have an end. Mm-hmm. The Ruh. Every creative thing, only Allah that's my uh, own. Mm-hmm. Is a pre eternal and that is inconceivable. But the Ruh has a beginning that the Ruh didn't have. Ma'indakum yanfad wa ma'indallahi baak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that is what that what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not perish. What is with you will perish. Right? There are certain things that does not perish. Right? Things that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we learn this in Aqeedah. From them is the ruh. From them is your soul. Right? Your soul was created, but your soul will not perish. Right? From them is the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From them is Jannah. But we don't say Jannah is everlasting. Jannah is ever continuous. There's a difference. We say Jannah is ever con- we when we speak the, you see the thing is in English we have to be more um, what's the word let's say we have to be more in depth right in Arabic is easier to understand but Jannah is ever continuous your soul is ever continuous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everlasting. Because remember, if you say something is continuous, meaning that it has a beginning and it continues. If you say something is everlasting, right? It didn't have a beginning, it just came into creation. So your soul is ever continuous, meaning that your soul had a beginning, but it just continues, right? The universe is ever expanding, right? The universe, as we speak, it's expanding. Right? To the left, to the right, to the side, every direction, the universe expands. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is everlasting. Right? Your soul is ever continuous. Jannah is ever continuous. Right? What time is that? Huh? Partially. Oh, it's 46. I thought it was 56. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us understanding and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in what is left from Sha'aban Allah ba'adifna fi bariyam in Sha'aban ba'adifna Ramadhan wa a'inna la siyami wal giyami wa gara'at al-Qur'an wa ba'idna an jamisui wal ithmi wal haram wa thabitna ala al-Islam wa khawilina al-Iman wa ja'alna min ahli al-Ihsan bi rahmatika ya rahimu ya rahman alhamdulillah wa kudam